Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, two freshman senators on the Jobs and Economic Growth Committee provide their views on Minnesota's economic health. Also, a possible new law to distinguish between service animals and pets. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Not only is my guest the vice chair of the Senate Jobs and Economic Growth Committee, he is also planning to sponsor bipartisan legislation aimed at preventing sex trafficking in Minnesota. Senator Paul Anderson now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Let's start with the economy. How would you assess Minnesota's economy right now? Well, I think the economy is good. We're seeing that uh, we've got low unemployment rates, uh, probably the lowest in almost 20 years here in the state. You know, you, you can peel that back and, and see we still have some challenges in some areas. I think we'll talk about the workforce shortage in different segments of our, our industry and small business. Uh, but at the same time, it's good. We're seeing more money in people's pockets. Uh, you, some people will be pro or con towards the uh, federal tax bill. But in the end, you're seeing bonuses, you're seeing higher wages, you're seeing some investment in, uh, in retirement funds. So I think more and more as we go along, you're gonna see people are pretty satisfied with the economy. Well, you bring up the issue of the workforce shortage yep. because our unemployment is so low. How big of a problem is that? And then also to find qualified workers, workers who fit the, the jobs that are out there right now. Absolutely, this is, you know, uh, business after business, when, when, when you talk with skilled, uh, labor in the workforce and in, in really what I've concentrated on is uh, skilled manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, and IT. You're seeing 20 to 30 percent vacancies in a lot of these companies. Uh, you talk to a construction company, you talk to a manufacturing plant, they are dying to have people come in that are skilled and ready to go. And so we worked on, last session we worked on the youth skills training program which brings, I call it the modernization of Votech bringing back a kind of a VOTEC option, pilot programs in school districts to get them on the job training. Um, we're talking about some scholarships, anything to draw these folks in. Because again, these are really good paying jobs. These are good benefit jobs. Uh, but oftentimes there's a stigma around whether or not uh, kids in high school want to go into these uh, industries. There's right, been into such the trades versus, yeah, versus exactly. college. So is part of the messaging that, that you know, maybe college doesn't have to be for everybody and some of these trade jobs are really a good fit? Absolutely, and over the last 20 years, I think there's been a real effort and, and for good reason, but we've seen that 20 year push to go to a four year school, you've seen uh, you know debt that's just incredible, but you've also seen this opportunity where um, we've got these jobs waiting uh, for people to come in, get trained, apprenticeships, uh, whether it's internships, uh, just get licensed, and they can start making good money without the debt of a four year school. Now it's not for everybody, and in both ways. Uh, there's a lot of uh, students that are graduating high school that really, uh, that four-year institution is not for them. And this is a really good career path. Uh, one other aspect of unemployment I want to touch on, our, our numbers are low, below 4%, mm -hmm. but uh, the Department of um, Economic Development, yeah. DEED, yeah. is separating them out now by demographics. And you still see that black Minnesotans um, are more out of work, as are Hispanic Minnesotans. Yeah. What could the legislature do to maybe tackle the disparity part? Yeah. I think there's there's more work to do here. Uh, so I sponsored a, a, a bill last year with regards to Summit Academy in Minneapolis. This is really looking at a lot of uh, uh, people that maybe struggled through school, maybe didn't get their uh, high school diploma or GED for various reasons, but really allow them a career path that gets their GED and puts them on training path and certification again to go work in maybe healthcare or construction. So there's different ways we can go about this, but it, we have to bring everybody to the table to address these situations. Now, I know your district is, is part of the metro area, yeah. but there's also a lot of talk about the economy in greater Minnesota. There was a recent MinPost article um, where interest groups representing rural areas outlined a desire for a bonding bill. I know the Senate's mm -hmm. on the bonding tours. Um, increases in local government aid, more street repairs, measures for affordable housing. There's pos in some yeah. areas of the state, there's not enough affordable housing for workers. And also the child care crisis. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on, on the legislature's roles in, in uh, helping growth in greater Minnesota? Yeah. Well, you think, you know, this is a wonderful state of about five and a half million people. 
the Twin Cities as a great uh, region in itself, but we have to look at what's going on in outstate Minnesota. And when you look at affordable housing and workforce housing shortage, uh, shortage in elderly care housing, we've got a real issue that I think we all have to roll up our sleeves and work on. And there's a commitment, I think, on a bipartisan uh, level to do that. There's a commitment in our caucus to, to take a serious look at this. Uh, local government aid, my district uh, doesn't receive any. We, 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 you know, we talk about fiscal disparities, so we're a net payer into the state. Uh, so we look at different ways on that. But in general, these are areas that states or cities uh, across the state have real needs, and we need to look at these in, in uh, 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 methodical um, uh, ways that we can address these issues. Before we go, I want to get your thoughts on sex trafficking yeah. in Minnesota. You are going to be the sponsor of a bill in the Senate that is going to change the the curriculum in public schools to include sexual exploitation prevention. Why? So this was brought to myself and a few other legislators by an incredible group out of Hopkins High School, Girls United Minnesota, uh, led by a, uh, a superstar junior, Jessica Melnick. And this is a group that started probably about five years ago in Hopkins Middle School. and. Uh, over the course of those uh, uh, four to five years, they take on big issues and this as is a group a of one. young women. Yes. And this is a real big issue. And this is a situation that a handful of years ago they saw on TV, they saw one of the students at Hopkins High School that was trafficking. And so they, they saw this as an opportunity, okay, how do we address this? Um, this is a real problem uh, nationally, locally, globally. I mean, there's, this has, has received more and more attention. And we have to educate folks to understand what are the signals, what are the um, just tragic situations going on right here in our community. You just don't think about that people will be trafficked here. You, you hear about uh, sex trafficking and, and children trafficking from around the world, but we have it going on here. And so these students looked at this issue and said, okay, uh, how do we educate ourselves? Because as they started asking questions, there weren't a lot of answers. And so in this, it's simply, this is a, this is a um, shell, not a uh, mandate to the school districts, but it's uh, offering them resources and information around sex trafficking that they can educate their students. So I think this is a common sense, pragmatic approach to uh, allowing our school districts, again, the opportunity to educate the students on, on these areas that are really serious to our uh, culture and our society. The FBI says that uh, Minnesota, or the Twin Cities, is actually the 13th largest center for, for child prostitution. Um, and sometimes people think these are immigrants that are yeah. in this, but it's actually all children across That's the right. board. That's one of the things Minnesotans maybe don't know. What are some other things? Well, again, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe not prevalent in, in everybody's lives, but it really is existing here. And so when you think of uh, sexual exploitation and, and uh, being trafficked, um, these are areas that in everyday walk of life, I mean, if this is happening in Hopkins School District a handful of years ago or in other school districts uh, around the suburbs, it's happening in the inner cities, it's happening in outstate, and again, it's just something we, we really have to keep working on. And there's been some champions, uh, Senator Klobuchar and Congressman Paulson have been uh, champions on the federal level, and I think you're seeing, and this is inspired uh, by some great high school, young women, high school students, but it's also something that you've, you've, you've seen in the press conference last week that there's bipartisan uh, work on this from Senator Pappas, Senator Pratt, mm -hmm. Senator uh, Nelson, and Senator Swazinski and myself in the Senate, uh, uh, just a litany of people in the House that want to tackle this situation because we, we just have to. Senator Anderson, right. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. The state demographer addressed key lawmakers this week and offered some alarming news about the trends and forecasts for public employment in Minnesota. Although the demographic shifts will start settling in over the next couple of decades, uh, the resulting composition that we have here as a state will be more or less permanent. We're making a shift right now to a new age structure, and that will stay in place into the foreseeable future. For the first time in our state's history, we'll have, by 2030, uh, as many older adults as we have 
young children, zero to 18, and in fact, those two lines cross even earlier if we're looking at school-aged children. You can see that, that overall, the number of dependents, including older adults and young children, will be growing at the same time that the share of working age will be declining. And we've made some projections about what the labor force will look like in the future. We expect that the growth will be very little going forward. In the past, in, about, in the 1990s, the labor force, all the people in Minnesota who were available to work, this is private sector, public sector together, grew by about 54,000 people each year during that decade, or about 540,000 over the course of the decade, and you can see that that number has declined considerably. Well, it creates what I might call a doom and gloom scenario. <laughs> no growth, we're gonna shrink our workforce, tax revenue will slow, and we can avoid that if we make purposeful changes, if we decide to make the state into a different uh, direction. And so, am I correct in this? Absolutely. The future is wide open. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we've already built into these projections increased migration that we think will happen because of the labor force uh, shortages. Um, so we do project considerable increase in migration over this time period already. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that, but it hasn't fully you know, turned around what we might expect. But certainly there may be policy levers that could change that. Joining me in the studio is Senator Matt Little, a member of the Jobs and Economic Growth Committee, to provide his thoughts on the current state of Minnesota's economy. Welcome, Senator Little. Well, thanks for having me. You serve on the Jobs and Economic Growth Finance and Policy Committee, as I just said. What is your assessment of the state's economy right now? Um, I think we're generally doing pretty good. Um, we have very low, low unemployment. People are buying houses. Uh, you can see a lot of businesses investing or reinvesting. Um, and the products they're making or the services they provide. So overall, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, I think there's some things that we should be worried about, though. Um, For example? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think uh, the, our housing stock, uh, we need a far more diversified and affordable housing stock. Um, home prices are quite high right now, and that's a product of a good economy, uh, but there is a downside to that. Um, and so we want people to be able to afford a home here in Minnesota so they can build up wealth and equity um, and be a little more financially stable. So I think that's one issue. I think the other issue that we're going to see, and this is more of a long-term um, problem, but is student debt. Student debt continues to keep people out of the housing market. It affects what types of jobs they can take, and it affects their mobility um, and which economies they can essentially work in. So um, right now we're doing really well, um, but there's some underlying currents that are concerning for the future. Many were disappointed to learn that the Twin Cities did not make yeah. Amazon's cut for their second headquarters. Uh, although the Twin Cities met many of the metrics that Amazon said that it was looking for, Senate Republicans are blaming Minnesota's high taxes and regulations. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on, on why we didn't get Amazon? Yeah, well, if Amazon is watching this show, I want to tell them that, of course, nothing is set in stone. They can still come to Lakeville, Minnesota, who did put in a bid. <laughs> okay. um, and I was really happy that they did, because um, we've, got, we've got great success in our industrial park and in our business community. That being said, um, I think sometimes here in St. Paul, people simplify an issue in order to further their political purposes. Um, the taxes and regulatory environment are not the only thing that a business is going to consider when they're, when they're moving. Um, and I think uh, cutting against our argument is Amazon is already here. We have a huge warehouse in Shakopee with 1,000 employees. So clearly Amazon thinks that Minnesota is a good place to be. Um, but there are a number of reasons why they would want to go elsewhere. I think um, you know, having uh, a diversified locations of their headquarters and warehouses is smart. Um, so they're not impacted by kind of regional economic situations as much. Um, they're looking at workforce, um, and I've already kind of mentioned we have really low unemployment here. So. Right, and that, that's my next question. I mean, yeah. Minnesota is at a 17-year low. The Department of Economic and uh, of Employment and Economic Development puts it at 3.1%. Mm -hmm. So 
you think possibly the tight labor market yeah. affected Amazon's decision. What else is, what other impacts are there for Yeah, Minnesota? certainly a uh, tight labor market is going to be something businesses are looking at. When you're looking at fi needing 50,000 employees um, and you see that everybody's already hired, that's difficult to come up with 50,000 new people or move 50,000 people into a certain area. Again, they look at housing market too. Is there the capacity for all these new employees um, to live in the area? Um, is it easy to get to transfer our employees to an area? Um, but they also look at transit and education infrastructure. Uh, we do really well in education infrastructure. I think we're a little weaker on transit um, than some of our competitors. Um, so making Although those some competitors had no transit systems, and that was pointed out in several articles. Yeah, which goes back to my original point, which is this is far more complex than any single um, point that you, mm -hmm. a political point that you want to make. There's so many factors that this company is considering. Um, but we should be happy. We're doing really well in Minnesota. We're still a Fortune 500 hub. Amazon does have a, presence, a huge presence here in Minnesota. We shouldn't forget that. Um, and so we'll be fine. You know, uh, we have a great economy here, a great metro economy, great rural economy. So we're going to be fine. I'd like to turn uh, briefly to the deed has a new the Department of, of Employment and Economic Development has a mm -hmm. new section in their reporting that examines unemployment by demographics. Mm -hmm. So while overall unemployment is low in the state, um, black Minnesotans are at 7.5 percent. Hispanic Minnesotans are at 5 percent. What do you think the legislature can do or should do to tackle the disparities in employment that still exist in the state? Yeah, I think there's no simple solution, right? Otherwise, we would have solved it by now. Uh, for me, I think it's all about access. Um, you know, there are certain neighborhoods and communities that don't have access to jobs in the area. Um, so that means they have to travel. Um, I already mentioned I think we're a little weaker in our transit, um, you know, kind of our transit sector. So um, if someone doesn't have a job, they can't afford to get the transportation to get to a job, and then they don't have a job, and they can't afford the transport. You know, that cycle continues. So we need to try and break that cycle by uh, providing access to a number of things, um, not just transit, um, but also training in college. You know, in Minnesota, we need to continue to make that cheap. Um, on the jobs committee, actually, we talked a lot about a pipeline program where people could learn skilled labor while getting paid. Um, so not only, you know, you're not a only getting a kind of apprenticeship. Yeah, Deal? exactly. So, and and I think that is critical, you know, because because people can't stop working all the time to get the training or the education they need. So, to be able to do both, I think it's a huge advantage. Um, and then finally, access to capital, so people can start their own small businesses in the areas they live. Um, you know, I'm a big supporter of um, there's an you know entrepreneurial uh, loan program that was started recently that provides access to capital for minorities, women, veterans, and folks with disabilities. Um, you know, so they can start their own small businesses and hopefully hire more people in their communities. Um, and so I think it's all about access, and, and that is really the, the long-term solution. I'd like to turn to a little of your personal history. You began public service as mayor of Lakeville. You're now entering your second <coughs> legislative session as a state senator. Have you, how have your views evolved from moving from local government to state government? Yeah. So one thing people forget, I was actually a city council member. That's where okay. I got my original start. Okay. Um, so that was back in 2010. Um, I, I think my my uh, political views uh, are, are are fairly much, uh, are fairly the same um, in terms of being pragmatic about our approaches and and trying to work um, in a bipartisan manner. Uh, my entire time on the council and as mayor, I worked with four Republicans, uh, city council members. Um, so uh, I think I have a lot more practice than a lot of people that, that come here new in terms of working with folks across the aisle to, to do better for your community. Um, but here, I think it, it is a little bit different in the fact that you don't spend that much time together. You know, you go on the floor and then you leave the floor. Um, you get to interact in committees and at some events, but you don't have the quality time that you do on a local board. Where you're so really day spending day, time getting, getting to know, know each other yeah. and their views and how maybe you could yeah. work together. Well, and just, you know, you, you share something in common, right? You share your community in common. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the same here. Um, now, there are, there are certainly similarities between communities, but you don't get that quality time that you do on a local board. So um, that does affect your views. One, one quick question before we go, because you have both a state and local perspective. Sure. How is Minnesota faring in keeping the local yeah. economies and local government viable? Yeah, I think in greater Minnesota, we need to do a better job of helping to repair infrastructure. If we're going to maintain the, the small town way of life in Minnesota, then we've got to be fixing the sewer systems and the water systems um, in these places so people can continue to live. 
Um, you know, there's also an argument that we're having here about the, the, the role of government in promoting broadband and, and having these local counties be able to use fast internet. Um, um, but I think we all agree that sewer and water are necessary. So we need to do a better job for our smaller towns. Um, but then secondly, I think there's, there's uh, been kind of an attack of local control. Um, as mayor, uh, as a former mayor, my, my position is um, let a city run itself um, in, in, in most aspects that they can. And don't try and, um, uh, try and dictate every little thing that they do. And I, and I think this last session we saw a number of bills that tried to dictate to cities what they can and cannot do. Um, and I don't think that's healthy for a relationship. There needs to be trust. Um, and, and there was an indication that the state government doesn't trust our cities and towns anymore. And I don't think that's healthy. Senator Little, I want to thank you so much for your time. Welcome to the program. I hope to have you back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hope to be back. According to a recent USA Today article, 19 states have enacted laws to crack down on people who pass off their pets as service animals. I recently sat down with Senator David Osmick to talk about some possible new statutes in Minnesota, and I began by asking him if there is confusion about the difference between service animals and emotional support animals. I think there is, and I think there's also abuse going on in the system. I think people are claiming either claiming a disability that they don't even don't really have they're overblowing a disability or they're out outwardly circ trying to circumvent parts of airlines and that you have to check your dog and, and and follow certain rules and they're trying to circumvent them and it's because we have become much more of a pet society i guess uh, but i think we really need to be careful on what we call a service dog and or service animal versus a convenience animal or your pet because these service animals are very highly trained and when you bring into an environment particularly in, a, you know, in an aircraft a pet or a pet that is not trained it can do a lot of damage to that service animal that they have spent months or even years developing so uh, I think it's worth uh, starting that discussion and that's why I'm starting to review what we have on the books and what is happening in other states, particularly in Virginia. I think it's important to note that the Americans with Disabilities Act distinguishes between service animals which are protected and can go in public places. It's the animal, which is either a dog or in some cases a miniature horse, is considered an extension of the person with the disability. These are federally protected. These animals, as you said, undergo significant training. Uh, examples are seeing eye dog or a hearing dog or a dog that helps someone with a seizure. Does, is, is education part of, of the mix here in terms of people understanding what a service dog truly is versus an emotional support kind of animal? Uh, yes, I think there is a, an educational component to it, uh, but I think also I think there is a component uh, beyond that that people are trying to take advantage of a situation. Um, you know, we have, I've heard stories already about people who move into a new apartment and the apartment says, no dogs allowed and everybody in the apartment building likes it that way because some, they may have allergies that they like the fact that there's no animals or no pets uh, and then a couple weeks after the person gets in there they suddenly come up with an excuse note from a doctor saying oh, I have to have this pet for whatever reason it's not necessarily a person who may have a serious or, or an ADA type of situation but they circumvent the whole process uh, and then all the people in that building are now subject to this. And how fair is it to the people that live in the building? So we're going to have to find a balance here or maybe some more educational means. And, and in some cases, it may have to be turning turn into punishment when we find people who are misrepresenting or abusing the system. In researching this segment, I read a number of news stories where citizens go online to purchase vests for their pet to make it look like a service animal. The Daily Beast reported that there's now a cottage industry of websites that for a price, you can buy service animal ID cards, certificates, and patches. Is this part of the problem, the availability of these sort of false service animal things? I absolutely agree. I think the more you can, the more of that abuse that goes on, it not only diminishes the service dogs, because when, it, when you have a service dog, that is something that's very important to you, but it also creates, like you said, these cottage industries that can falsely represent what really a service dog is. So uh, I, I don't know if it's more of a federal issue where we have to have some type of a common ID that says this is a service dog. Uh, I have any, I, I'm going to be speaking with 
the folks that train these dogs to find out what type of, not only the, more about the training that service animals have, but also about what do they have for identification so that they can show, you know, what, do they have a card that specifically says, I, I don't know a lot about the subject matter, but I'm gonna learn more about it as we go. But I wanna make sure that we do the right thing in Minnesota and find out what, if this is a problem, and if so, how to deal with it. Both, as you mentioned, Virginia passed a law, Colorado also passed a law uh, that imposes fines for people who pass off their pet as a service animal. In terms of businesses, the ADA only allows two questions that mm -hmm. can be asked to a person. What task does your animal perform? And uh, is this animal required because of a disability? So service dogs actually don't have ID. So maybe, as you said, there should be a national ID. But won't any kind of law be difficult to enforce? Um, that's the part of the challenge of this legislation. If we're going to go down this path, first we have to identify the problem. We have to pro have some hearings to find out what is the actual issue. Talk to people like Delta Airlines and find out what they're experiencing. But I think one other question would be at the federal level is to talk about these ADA questions and is there some type of a certification, you know, is there more to just those two questions? that needs to be asked, or is there some type of certification that they can get that says this dog is ADA compliant? Well, that comes with it, a stamp of approval that makes it much more difficult for you to pass off Fluffy as your service dog. It's actually not a service dog, it's just your, your pet. So there's a lot of work to be done on this one, and there may be some things with ADA we need to review too, but that's our friends in Washington, D.C. Well, I think there'll be some pushback though, because Americans and Minnesotans, I presume, love their pets. Marketresearch.com projects $96 billion in spending on pets by 2020. Don't people have a right, if their animals well behave, to bring them where they want to bring them? Perhaps, but it's also the right of the business not to have things happen. I mean, even the most well-behaved dog it can have accidents, can, it can become nervous and go beyond the training that it has. So. I think there's a great, there's a balance that can be struck. Uh, the private property rights of the businesses or your own individual, uh, your own individual rights need to be balanced. So we have a long discussion, I think, ahead of us as far as what we're going to do. One final question, an attorney for the National Disability Rights Network, which advocates on behalf of people with disabilities, argue that the laws, in essence, should aim to educate rather than punish. Do you agree? Uh, I think education would be a whole lot easier than creating the, the pet police running around to everybody's business or going to the airport. Uh, I, I really don't like having to go in that direction. Education is probably the f easiest and fastest one to do, uh, but I won't throw out anything as far as what, where we would go with this one. We need to identify the issue and find out really how bad it is. It's possible that maybe the issue isn't as bad as we think it is, but maybe with some education or maybe just the fact that we're talking about it will make some of these pet owners who are falsely or circumventing the process understand that you might not want to do that anymore with Fluffy. Senator Osmick, thanks so much. Thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.